I'd like to start with what I hope is not a controversial statement. Uh, rich people are not all the same. Um, I bring up this fact because we live in a time of high inequality when demonizing the rich is popular in some political circles, so not the ones I hang around in. Um, and when there's a variety of policies being proposed to increase the redistribution of economic resources. Now, I'm not going to take Catherine up on her suggestion just to decide whether we need more redistribution of economic resources. That's an issue as much for political philosophy as it is for economists. I'm just going to say, suppose we're going to increase the redistribution of economic resources more. How do we do it? Uh, and in particular, as we think about uh, alternative proposals, I think it's really important to keep in mind uh, that rich people uh, differ uh, from one another. So let's consider two hypothetical CEOs of major corporations. Each of them earn a lot of money, 10 or $20 million a year, say, putting them safely in the top one one hundredth of 1% of the income distribution. But other than their incomes, which are the same, these two executives are very different. The first executive I'll call Sam Spendthrift. He uses all his money living the high life drinks expensive wine, drives Ferraris, flies his private jet to lavish vacations. He gives large amounts to political parties and candidates, hoping these contributions will get him an ambassadorship someday. Uh, when that doesn't work, he spends large sums financing his own quixotic run for the presidency. I don't have anybody particular in mind. Uh, the other executive I'll call Frank Frugal. He makes just as much money as Sam, but he takes a very different approach to his good fortune. He lives modestly, saves most of his earnings, and accumulating a sizable nest egg. He forgoes the opportunity to influence the political process. He's not really very political. Instead, he invests his money in successful startups, which he happens to be quite good at identifying. He plans to leave some of his wealth to his children, grandchildren, nephews, and nieces. Most of his wealth, however, he plans to bequeath. To, his, to the endowment of his alma mater, maybe Harvard, where it will support financial aid uh, for generations to come. Okay, now ask yourself, who should pay higher taxes? Sam Spendthrift or Frank Frugal? Now I can see the case for taxing them the same. After all, they have the same earnings. One might say that how they choose to spend their money is not an issue for the government to judge or influence. Personally, however, I'm more inclined to think that Mr. Frugal should be taxed less than Mr. Spendthrift. And the argument is really Pagovian. It has to do with externalities. Mr. Frugal's behavior confers positive externalities both on members of his extended family and on the beneficiaries of his charitable bequest. Moreover, by increasing the economy's capital stock, he reduces the rate of return to capital, increases labor productivity and real wages. Economists will recognize that as a pecuniary externality, but if one's concerned about the income distribution, this pecuniary externality can also be viewed uh, as desirable. Now, what I find hard to believe is that Mr. Frugal should face higher taxes than Mr. Spendthrift. But that is what occurs under the policy proposals being discussed, in particular the wealth taxes being advocated by Senators Warren and, and Sanders. Now I'm skeptical that these taxes can be implemented successfully, but I'm not going to actually talk about that today, given the limited time. But let's suppose they are su implemented successfully. These taxes are going to hit Frank Frugal hard and are going to be much easier on Sam Spendthrift because he doesn't accumulate the large nest egg. Now you might say, okay, well, that's just the cost of, of redistributing economic resources, and if this was the only possible tax on the table, then I can kind of see the argument in favor. But there are a lot of other ideas uh, that, are on, that are on the table. And I think, in particular, there are ways to redistribute economic resources in ways that, that do not penalize frugality. In particular, I am attracted to something along the lines of the policy now being championed by Andrew Yang the former tech executive and the entrepreneur who is now running for the Democratic nomination. Mr. Yang proposes enacting a value-added tax and using the revenue to provide every American with a universal basic income of $1,000 a month, which he calls a freedom dividend. It's pretty easy to see how this idea would work. Value-added taxes are essentially sales taxes. They're used in a lot of European nations and they've pro proven remarkably efficient ways to raise revenue. And because the dividend is universal, it would be simple to administer. 
Now, of course, the idea of a universal basic income is not new. But it is certainly bold compared to the system we have in place now. The idea has its critics. And what I want to do is talk about some of the uh, arguments that people make um, about uh, opposed to a universal basic income. I think there's some valid arguments, but I think a lot of the arguments you hear really don't hold up under scrutiny. So let me use, use an example to, um, to discuss why. OK, I want, you, I want to consider two possible social safety nets, which you're going to see in the screen in front of you in, in a second. For, for the purposes of today, let's assume these are balanced budget, so we don't have to worry about deficit issues. The first one is a, uh, a means-tested transfer. So we're going to give everybody $1,000 per month aimed at the truly needy. So the full amount goes to somebody with zero income, for a person at the very bottom. The transfer is then phased out. Recipients lose 20 cents for every dollar of income they earn. These transfers are financed by a progressive income tax. So it is no, no, no taxes on below $60,000 and a 20% uh, tax on all income above $60,000. Now the second policy is cl closer to what Mr. Yang is proposing, a universal transfer of $1,000 per month for every person financed by a 20% flat tax on all incomes. Now think for a moment whether you'd prefer to live in a society with safety net A or safety net B. Now, I'm not going to take a vote here, uh, but I did actually take this to a bunch of Harvard students, Harvard undergraduates, and I gave them exactly this experiment. And they were unequivocal in their preference, absolutely unequivocal. Over 90% said plan A is clearly better. And uh, the argument basically ran as follows. Plan A targets the transfer payments on those who are truly needy. As a result, it requires a smaller tax increase. Moreover, the taxes are levied only on those people with really high incomes. Plan B is crazy. Why should rich people like Bill Gates and Jeff Bezos receive government transfers? They don't need it. And if they give it to them, they have to raise taxes more to pay for it. Well, superficially, you can see these arguments seem appealing. But here's the rub. As the economists note, these policies are exactly the same. Look at the net payment that is taxes less transfers. Everyone gets exactly the same under these two plans. Person with zero income gets $12,000 per year in both cases. Person with an annual income of $60,000 gets exactly zero. A person with income of $160,000 pays $20,000 in both cases. And everyone fa faces the same set of incentives, a 20% effective marginal tax rate for every dollar of income. In other words, everybody's welfare is identical under the two plans, and everyone faces the same set of incentives. The difference between plan A and plan B is only a matter of framing. Now, I bring this up. This is kind of obvious to the economists in the audience, but I bring this up because I think it te teaches really two important lessons. First, if somebody finds something like plan A attractive, which all my Harvard students did, and once they sort of recognize the logic that it says plan A and plan B is equivalent, they should find something like plan B attractive. Many critics of universal basic income seem to fail to make this leap because they don't notice the equivalence of the, the two approaches. And I've had debates with some economists who didn't no notice it the first time they saw it. But once you see the equivalence of plan A and plan B, plan B is much easier to embrace. And I think it looks even better when you realize that universal benefits and flat taxes may be easier to administer than means-tested benefits and progressive taxes. The second lesson from this example is how misleading it is to focus on taxes and transfers separately. Now, it is fully accurate in comparing Plan A and Plan B to say that Plan A has lower taxes, Plan A has more progressive taxes, and Plan A has more progressive transfers. That's all true. But so what? Those facts don't stop it from being precisely equivalent to Plan B. The equivalence of these two plans is clear only when you consider taxes and transfers together. Now, I stress this fact because it's all too common to see academic papers and media articles describe the distribution of taxes without considering the distribution of the transfers they finance. In fact, Emmanuel did that with us just a few minutes ago. From my perspective, such presentations of the data are incomplete to the point of being deceptive. With this, that kind of incomplete reporting, you would conclude that Plan A, that a society using Plan A is a more progressive society than a society using Plan B. 
But that is obviously not the case because the policies are functionally the same. Finally, I should note that the safety net described in either of these plans, which I, I view as equivalent and therefore the difference not being important, the, 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 uh, the plan is really just a version of the negative income tax. Uh, Milton Friedman first proposed it in a, in a book, I don't know if he probably wasn't the first, but I first read it in Milton Friedman's book, Capitalism and Freedom, back in 1962 was when he wrote it. Um, I remember reading this as a student 40 years ago uh, and thinking it was a pretty good idea. Um, and it turns out I was not alone in that judgment. A few years after that, that there was an uh, open letter um, in 1968 uh, was signed by more than a thousand economists endorsing a negative income tax plans along these lines. They didn't have particular numbers involved, but it was the, on the general principle of a negative income tax. And it was signed by such luminaries as James Tobin, Paul Samuelson, Peter Diamond, Martin Feldstein. Now, of course, they, they weren't all luminaries at the time, but they became luminaries. Um, so what, so what, what um, Andrew Yang is proposing it's basically a version of what these thousand economists uh, endorsed uh, back in um, 1968. There's a little difference. Uh, I think the 68 economists were talking about a tax on income. Andrew Yang is, is, is focused on consumption of the value-added tax. From my perspective, that's actually better because it doesn't distort the intertemporal incentive to, to save and invest. Um, but it's sort of, it's, it's, I think, morally equivalent in equivalent a lot of ways to what was being talked about um, by those thousand economists in 1968. Now you have to ask the question of, could a thousand economists all be wrong? <laughs> <laughs> well, well, yes, they could. <laughs> so I have to admit that. Um, but I don't think in this case they are. Uh, my own view is that a universal income financed by an efficient tax, um, something like a value-added tax, uh, might well be something worth considering. And indeed, I'm one of the signatories, as is, as is Larry Summers, of a plan to do something similar in a much smaller way, but, but financing with a carbon tax. We're, we're a part of a group called the Climate Leadership Council that's proposing a, a carbon tax and rebating the uh, revenue from the carbon tax lump sum to all house to all households, uh, and that's effect in a very small way, a little bit like the uh, uh, universal uh, basic income. Uh, thank you very much, and let me, I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you for watching. We hope you enjoyed. And before we go, I want to give a huge thank you to all of our God tier patrons over on Patreon. We have to start thinking much, much bigger about what we can get done. Where's the money? Where's the money? We have the money. Where's the money? Where's the money? We have the money.